Don't scab for the bosses, don't listen to their lies. Us poor folks haven't got a chance, lest we organize. Which side are you on? Which side are you on? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna add Dave Ramsey to our list of people that we're inciting <laughs> violence against. Yeah. Um, in 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 Minecraft, not in yes. real life, in video games. Yeah. Yes. Um, in parodies only. Exactly, parody violence. Parody allegedly. Violence. Alleged. Par parodical <laughs> violence against Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey. Which is very fair. I mean, yeah, and like it's just that like general idea that like. If you're poor, it's it's your fault, yeah, you know. Even though, like, exactly, I don't know. Even though you're like grifting a bunch of people by exactly. like selling them common sense fin- finance <laughs> ideas, it's like, why don't we have better financial literacy in schools so that yeah. people don't have to take grifters fucking finance <laughs> classes? Literally, his advice was like, don't go into debt. It's like okay, <laughs> like thanks, dog. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's a don't, obvious. Don't one. go into debt. Yeah. <laughs> Cut up your credit cards. It's like, yeah, yeah I guess. Like, but I like, know. oh my god, which we don't even need to. We can have an episode about credit cards. But like, my whole thing, the only thing I fucking learned in high school financial literacy was basically to not open up a credit card. But you have to fucking open up a credit card. Like, you have to. Yeah. You have to have a credit score, and a credit card pretty much is what gets you that credit <laughs> score. To like do things like get a car and shit. Yeah. So I was so pissed off when I figured that out. Ugh. It's very frustrating. the The whole system. Honestly, that would be a fun episode because I be. got I got thoughts. Oh, and I got I, the what? I got insider knowledge. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. But uh, anyway, this is remarks Hi. for a podcast. We are a podcast. My name is Phoebe. Oh wait, fuck. Oh my god. <laughs> I'm my name's Taylor. I'm actually. Taylor's um, twin <laughs> that he ate in utero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's straight facts there. But <laughs> I ate the twin in utero. Um, but now she's here. Yeah, and he, well, he ate it in utero, carried it to term in his own utero, oh. <laughs> birthed me, and now I'm here. And my name is Phoebe. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a pretty. I feel like that's uh, the 100 percent true and real. Mm-hmm. Um, trial, if you podcast will, yeah. origin story. No, it's true. <laughs> I came out and I was like, "Should we make a podcast together?" I was like, "I feel like we have to now." Like yeah. after what we just it, what just happened. Yeah, a, we went through a life journey <laughs> together already. It's true. It's true. <laughs> um, this week is uh, part two of yeah. Cold War Nader. Do you want to you want to tell Chili War, <laughs> the Frosty War, Frosty War. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, what you're going to do? Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about the Cold War. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about... I, I went back a little bit to just um, cover some of the Cuba stuff. Mm-hmm. But I'm just going to take us through like mid-Cold War through to the end. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. First, I do just quickly... Sorry to like turn down the mood and make it somber but um i do just want to acknowledge the victims who were murdered and injured in kenosha due to an alt-right terrorist who i won't name because Mm -hmm. he's already gotten plenty of press too much press yeah um so one of the victims who died um was joseph rosenbaum he was 36 years old he was murdered on august 25th 2020 he leaves behind a three-year-old daughter and a fiance um, and his sister writes on Facebook, quote, may you forever be with the angels and rest easy, bro. I love you. Um, one of the other victims was Anthony Huber. He was 26. He was a talented skateboarder and he leaves behind a girlfriend and a stepdaughter. He was actually attempting to fight back against the terrorist after he had already shot um, uh, Joseph Rosenbaum. He attempted to use his skateboard as a weapon and he was killed in the act. Um, and then Gage Grosskreutz, who is now 27, um, he was acting as a medic at the August 25th, 2020 protest for Jacob Blake. Um, and he was shot just moments after he had been treating another protester's injuries, which were unrelated to the terrorist attack. Mm -hmm. Um, Gage Grosskreutz lived, um, but he 
was injured on his right bicep, I believe, and he just uh, had to, like, participate in that trial, which I'm sure was extremely traumatic for him. Um, Few of us are surprised by the outcome of the recent trial for these murders and attempted murder. This is how the United States has operated for decades, with an increasing overtness with each passing year. There is no criminal justice system in America. There is an organized punishment system that aims to uphold the oppression of the black, the poor, the working class, the stolen, the indigenous, and anyone else the elite has deemed as beneath them and worthy only of slave labor. We will only continue to see an increase in blatant examples of what this system is designed to do. Mourn, stay angry, prepare yourselves for the inevitable, which is going to be a sustained pushing of the envelope from the elite. Mentally prepare yourself for more painful outcomes so you can direct your anger and pain into the faces of those responsible. Be careful with each other so we can be dangerous together. Absolutely. Well said. Well said. Thank you. And yeah, again, it's very discouraging. We obviously live in a nation that... Will 100% always side with a fasc- with a fascist mm-hmm. movement over uh, any kind of progressive change, and um, that uh, is disheartening. But yeah. you know, I I was at a little uh, little get together this weekend for uh, Joe Hill, mm-hmm. the uh, the organizer um, who was mur- who was like falsely uh, tried here in Utah mm-hmm. back in like the 1920s. Mm-hmm. And uh, was eventually executed for it. Yeah. Um, and I think like one of the big slogans for that is like, don't don't mourn, organize. Yeah. Um, which, you know, not to say that you can't mourn, of course, for but sure. like, uh, but let your your mourning turn into action. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <sighs> so, yeah, um, things are rough and uh, we're sorry and we love you and. Let's all work together. Yeah. If you're going through a rough time, hit us up on any of the socials. We're here to help. Yeah, for real. We're down to talk <clears throat> about it. Um, okay. Well, let's talk about the Cold War now. <laughs> <laughs> Moving to the Cold War. Moving to the Cold War, the Chili War, the Frosty War. Um, so because I'm me and I am the resident Cuba stan on the pod, I'm gonna <laughs> start my story with the Bay of Pigs. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Um, so on April 7th, 1961, the Bay of Pigs invasion was an attempt by the CIA and the Kennedy administration to take back power in Cuba. My boy, Fidel Castro, had overthrown Filgenico Batista, um, who was the American-backed dictator of Cuba. Taylor covered a little bit of this last week. Um, Mm -hmm. Fidel had taken control of Cuba and turned it into a communist nation. Um, And then about 1,400 Cubans relocated to Miami. The U.S. saw this as an opportunity to regain the power that they had had in Cuba. Um, And the CIA trained these Cuban immigrants and attempted to invade Cuba. But these troops were wholly unprepared for the power of Fidel's revolution, and the invasion failed after less than just 24 hours, Uh Um, which I did also talk about the Bay of Pigs on another episode in more detail. Go listen to that one. That one was good. (laughs) Um, So the United States was particularly interested in Cuba because of Fidel Castro's communist ideals and because of their relationship with the Soviet Union. So in May of 1960, Cuba established uh, diplomatic relations (laughs) with the Soviet Union in response um, to that. The United States ended their sugar trade with Cuba and cut off sending any aid over to Cuba. Thus began the embargo. Exactly. Um, So the Soviet Union picks up the slack from the U.S. and they took on all of the imports of sugar from Cuba to help bolster the Cuban economy. Um, And that just further strengthened the relationship between Cuba and the Soviet Union and Mm -hmm. widened the rift between the U.S. and Cuba. Yeah. Um, Which still exists to this day. (laughs) Um, And then in January of 1961, the U.S. ended all diplomatic relations with Cuba and prepared for the Bay of Pigs invasion. Um, And this is where it becomes clear that Cuba was very much just a pawn for America to use as an advancement in the Cold War. Um, Many advisors to Kennedy were warning him against a potential invasion of Cuba. They were telling him that Fidel Castro wasn't really a true threat to America and that basically if left alone, Cuba would just kind of continue to exist and wouldn't bother america which is facts honestly yeah like, like fidel's just like yo can we just can we just vibe for a sec yeah. can we just vibe <laughs> but 
But um, Kennedy, he believed that he would win an invasion against the Cuban revolutionaries and Fidel. And he saw this as an opportunity to prove himself in the Cold War. And he thought that if he could take back Cuba, a communist country, he could prove to Russia and China that he was serious about winning. Which obviously didn't go well. (laughs) Not go well. Sorry, Kennedy. Sorry, Kennedy. You underestimated Cuba one too many times. Um, And, of course, I mean, there was, like, Kennedy was sour because um, Fidel, like, changed a lot of American-owned businesses in Cuba into, like, Cuban-owned businesses Mm -hmm. and whatever. There was all these reasons. But one of the big reasons why we did anything with Cuba was because the Soviet Union had a relationship with them. Yeah. No, and I I remember, like, there was that big thing on, like, Twitter where everybody was like, my grandma's... (laughs) uh, far you know like plantation plantation got taken from us or whatever and uh you know and it's like bummer but like what happened to it is like oh, it was nationalized yeah so that like other people could work it and it was given back to like cuban workers you exactly. know exactly <laughs> yeah so it's like okay well sorry but i'm not that sympathetic <laughs> So, as Taylor told us about last week, around this time, the U.S. enters the Vietnam War. Um, In 1960, the National Liberation Front, or as the U.S. was calling it, the Viet Cong, was formed. This insurgency group began fighting southern Vietnam with the backing of North Vietnamese government officials. Um, JFK began efforts against the Viet Cong in May of 1961 when he sent 400 Green Berets to Vietnam to begin secret operations against the Viet Cong. Um, which brings us to a dark spot of many dark spots on American uh, history, which pretty much, I guess, the entire history is just one big giant (laughs) giant dark spot. (laughs) (laughs) In January of 1962, the U.S. launched Operation Ranch Hand, which was when the U.S. dumped about 20 million gallons of chemicals over forests and crops in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos for almost 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you may have heard about a... Agent Orange. Well, this is where that term comes from. Agent Orange is an herbicide that the U.S. military used to kill the dense forests that the Viet Cong would hide in, and as well as to kill the crops that would feed not only soldiers, but civilian residents of Vietnam. What made Agent Orange so dangerous was dioxin. This is a byproduct that's created when producing herbicides. Dioxins are highly toxic, not only to plants, but to humans as well. Um, dioxins are commonly produced from burning toxic materials, such as like when you're incinerating trash, burning oils, um, like gases and coal. They can come from cigarette smoke and from industrial bleaching processes like the ones used for cotton or paper and are also found in in gases from chlorine. The most toxic kind of dioxin is known as TCDD or tetrachlorodibenzo-p-dioxin. TCDD has a half-life of seven to nine years in humans, and by then, many of the negative effects have already taken place, which are super (laughs) fun. Um, TCDD causes a severe skin condition called chloracne, which is when the skin becomes covered in painful cysts, blackheads, and pustules that appear like a severe acne. Um, We'll post a picture of that because it's horrifying. Yeah. I will look it up for you. I'm yeah, I know. I would like to see. Yeah, chemical warfare is uh good stuff. Good always. and cool. Moonshine. Live reaction to the chloracne. Oh goodness. Yeah. Geez. Yeah, that's oh, that's that's gnarly. Yeah. Let's we'll definitely just, post a picture, but like yeah. horribly, horribly painful Oh, much. I can only imagine, yeah. <laughs> Jeez. So, um, TCDD also causes liver failure, and it has been linked to type 2 diabetes, immune system dysfunction, nerve disorders, muscular dysfunction, hormone disruption, heart disease, and many cancers. Wow. (laughs) Woo! It causes many problems with pregnancies, including miscarriage, spina bifida, and other neurological developmental difficulties in fetuses. So, good. (laughs) <laughs> the United States dumped Agent Orange, which had incredibly high levels of TCDD, onto crops, farmlands, rice paddies, canals, and rivers of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos for nine years. 
Um, and during this reign of chemical warfare, the water sources and crops of South Vietnam, who was not a part of this war, were also contaminated. Vietnam has reported that over 400,000 people have died or experienced severe health complications due to Agent Orange, and that 500,000 children have been born with complications caused by Agent Orange. Um, they have also said that over 2 million people are living with cancers or other severe illnesses caused by Agent Orange, um, not to mention the impact that pouring 20 million gallons of poison over the forests and farms of Vietnam's and other close nations had on the environment. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say the environment, the food supply, like, yeah. literally. Ugh. The water, the, like. Yeah, the water for who knows how long. Yeah. The land for Which who knows so how long. Which is so goddamn evil. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, any kind of chemical or, like, bio- chemical, biological warfare, mm-hmm. any of that, like, it's it's grotesque. It's the worst Truly, thing. Truly, yeah. It's, it was, like, a, a defoliator, I think they called it. So, basically, it would, like, cause like plants to shrivel up and like drop all their leaves which is why they Um, were doing it was to like i mean also because they're evil but yeah yeah to like help them see better (laughs) yeah because it was such a guerrilla war exactly yep which we'll be talking about that in a few weeks yeah we uh, we did decide we are going to do um a vietnam episode yeah i'm excited i'm excited i don't know about you (laughs) vietnam all right (laughs) (laughs) We do want to go. Um, we want to go really bad. Yeah, I would love to go visit Vietnam. I've heard it's a beautiful it's place. It's so beautiful. So who's responsible for producing this chemical war crime? Everyone's favorite evil chemical company is Monsanto and Dow Chemical. <laughs> Dow Chemical. Woo! Which um, I posted on the Instagram a little bit ago. I was like looking up shit about Dow Chemical. And I don't even remember how I like found it but one of the google <laughs> suggestions was like is dow chemical a good company to work for and it's like dow com- ca- dow chemical really values <laughs> safety and they're just so safe and we love safety and it was like bro you are literally responsible for killing millions so of so many people i mean it's the same as like i don't know it's funny to like look at like raytheon's twitter <laughs> like or their website and it's like they're like posting like just funny little quirky things and it's like <laughs> Don't, don't, doesn't the U.S. use your weapons to, like, bomb weddings in Yemen? Like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like, don't pretend that you're just, like, a normal thing. Didn't they also rainbow their fucking profile picture? Yeah, they did. Like, they fucking, for sure did. <laughs> Jesus fucking. We live in the darkest timeline, uh, truly. Yeah, rainbow profile picture while you're making <laughs> missiles made of knives that the U.S. fucking bombs. <laughs> bombs Yemen uh, with like oh my god literally knife missiles it's uh, no and it, I thought it was a joke at first but no they actually real. make a missile that's made out of knives look that shit up it's insane oh my god <laughs> it's supposed to be more like precise so it doesn't like <laughs> explode as much you know sure <sighs> knife missiles baby knife <laughs> missiles um so we could definitely do an entire episode on Monsanto and Dow's involvement in helping America murder millions of people through chemical war crimes, but uh, that will be for another time. Also, hmm. side note, Dow also produced napalm for the United States during the Vietnam War. So, ah, yeah, of course they did. Sweet. Uh, yeah. Of course they did. <laughs> so anyway, back to Cuba. So, on February 7th, 1962, John F. Kennedy finished what he started and ended all trade with Cuba. So, this embargo is still in place to this day, (laughs) despite being somewhat lifted under the Carter and Obama administrations. Mm -hmm. Um, This trade embargo made a deep mark on Cuba's economy, and this, along with American travel restrictions, has shaped Cuba and America's future forever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you just you were just, it was just recently that I guess under Obama and, and Carter that you could do uh you could get like Cuban cigars again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and but um yeah now we still have to we have to go to some special fucking like department and get like special papers to be able to go to Cuba. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, (laughs) that's normal and totally fine. And it's kind of baffling to me, too, because, like, and and I know, which we'll get to, that, like, the Cold War ended and that, like, the Soviet Union, which eventually wasn't even a thing, and the United States, like, made nice with each other. Yeah. But, like, we were at at war-ish 
with the Soviet Union for like years and we were never actually at war with Cuba mm-hmm. at all. So it's like why I feel like it would make more sense that we wouldn't be allowed to go to like Russia. Yeah. Uh, I don't stupid. know. I think it's because Cuba has held on to like those communist ties whereas True. like Russia had a very big like obviously after the Soviet Union fell it was like very big like mm-hmm. oh we're going to redo the economy and then we were like ah you're capitalist now or yeah. whatever so we're friends yeah, yeah. we're friends because you aren't one of them dirty commies like <laughs> yeah and yeah the u.s fucking hated fidel and he was mm-hmm. the leader of cuba until like 2008 or whatever when he yeah, died very recently so um yeah um we're gonna just uh, take a quick ad break. Stare at some pictures of Fidel Castro. Oh yeah, sexy daddy Fidel Castro. <sighs> daddy Fidel. Yeah, very, very. You know who also thinks that Fidel Castro <laughs> is a daddy? Uh, these ads. These ads. <laughs> uh, ads. Um, so we're back. Uh, Phoebe and I are just talking about how we're for sure going to be making this uh, a no fat podcast now. <laughs> That's our new trajectory. Yeah. Um, because if you masturbate, you just will never get anything done ever. And um, you're just doomed to a life of never succeeding. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure um, only the only successful people that I've ever heard of mm-hmm. are ones that just didn't masturbate. It's true. Historically, you can look it up. Like that's why the Roman empire fell. Yeah. It wasn't too much masturbating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jesus Christ never masturbated. Yep. Not a day in his and life. Look at him now. And <laughs> look at him now. He's <laughs> probably the most famous person <laughs> ever. Right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, no fap. Uh, anyway, yeah. uh, you know who, <laughs> did masturbate uh stalin i don't know <laughs> i i really for a minute thought you were gonna be like phoebe <laughs> no i would oh now you like that phoebe <laughs> as a as a masturbator yeah also i mean, also i just don't know your your masturbating habits so <laughs> I actually literally think we've talked about you it. You know, I we think might we talked have. talked about it literally yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> we might have. We probably did. I But like I don't know the I don't know the specifics. True. You want to? <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, sure. <laughs> we'll talk off air. <laughs> I'm just kidding everyone. Um so, Cuba. Travel restrictions. <laughs> wow. I'm having a hard time talking. Embargoes. Good thing I have a podcast. All right. So, yeah. So, um, the embargo against Cuba, the travel restrictions against Cuba. So, the United States misses out on about $5 billion yearly that they could be making from trade with Cuba. Like, still. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. $5 billion? I mean, it's better now because we've, like, healed the trade relationship mm-hmm. with Cuba a bit. But, yes. <laughs> crazy insane and if there's one thing america loves it's money so i'm just like you guys yeah hello (laughs) yeah it's like do you hate like you hate (laughs) com not even like communism necessarily you just hate fidel castro yeah more than you love money like that's that's next level (laughs) that says something (laughs) yeah so because of this full trade embargo from America, Cuba, Cuba began to rely even more heavily on the Soviet Union to support their economy. Um, and the relationship between Cuba and the Soviet Union grew stronger and stronger, eventually leading to the Soviet Union arming Cuba with nuclear weapons to protect them against any further U.S. invasions. Which brings us to the Cuban Missile, Missile Crisis. crisis. <laughs> we'll get an air horn at some point. Oh yeah, I'm planning. I'm I'm working. It's in the works. It's in the works. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Happy to hear it. So, the Soviet Union definitely cared for Cuba and Fidel Castro had formed a relationship with Nikita Khrushchev, but um the arming of Cuba was also yet another attempt by one of the two players of the Cold War to prove that they were bigger and better than the other one. Um Kennedy had been warning of a nuclear imbalance between the Soviet Union and the United States since he had been campaigning for president and he actually called out Richard Nixon saying that he had been too lax with the Soviet Union 
um, and their creation of nuclear weapons and allowed for a missile gap to occur. And so when the Soviet Union began setting up nuclear missiles in Cuba in July of 1962, Kennedy lost his fucking shit. (laughs) Yeah. It's kind of crazy because I... I'm trying to, I don't know the full, I don't know the story exactly because I Mm -hmm. didn't research anything this week. Uh, (laughs) But I believe there was like 13 days where it was Mm -hmm. like, no one, we were like, are we going to get blowed up? Like, no one knew. Is literally every single one of us going to die (laughs) of nuclear warfare or are we good? (laughs) Yeah. Or like, is it, is it chill, dog? Like, yeah, it's insane. Moonshine. Hey, you got to (laughs) go. She's trying to eat my nails. Which I get. <laughs> um, so, the U.S. intelligence became aware of this situation when they were performing a routine surveillance flight over Cuba, and they noticed several Soviet bombers and missile sites under construction. On September 4th, 1962, Kennedy released an official public warning to the Soviet Union against the implementation of nuclear weapons in Cuba. The Soviet Union ignored this warning and continued on in the <laughs> nuclear arming of Cuba. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Another U.S. surveillance flight sent back photographs to the White House on October 15th of more nuclear missile sites being set up, and this began what we call the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, keep in mind that the idea that the Soviet Union was out nuking us is completely fabricated. The United States had more nuclear weapons than the Soviet Union by a long shot, and the introduction of more missiles in Cuba still wouldn't skew that number in the Soviet Union's favor. But regardless of this fact, Kennedy pursued with a strong pushback against Cuba and the Soviet Union. On October 22nd, Kennedy announced a naval quarantine on Cuba. And it's important to note the... No, bleh, Jesus Christ, today <laughs> I'm having a hard time. It's important to note the use of the word quarantine because if Kennedy were to have used the word blockade, it would have meant that he had declared war on Cuba. Um, and therefore declared war on the Soviet Union. I don't. Uh, it's yeah. It's such stupid. A like shit, yeah, yeah, exactly. But if you call it a quarantine, it's fine. Even though you're <laughs> doing a blockade, it's the same fucking thing. It's wild. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I just think it's funny that America, like, because I feel like if America had its way, we would be the only country with nuclear weapons. Oh, for sure. And uh, we would police the world more so than we already do. Mm-hmm. But, like, even, like, just a country having, like, a fraction of the nuclear power we had, we were like, holy shit. Exactly. Oh, my God. Like, just losing our fucking right. minds. Like, exactly. <laughs> it's like, bro, you literally have a huge stockpile of fucking nuclear ass weapons. Yeah. Like, it's just American, like, hypocrisy at its finest. Yeah, exactly. You know? And, like, literally the reason why the Soviet Union gave Cuba these nuclear weapons, just also, like, aside from that they just wanted to be like, hey, America, fuck you, mm-hmm. was that America invaded Cuba. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. the Soviet Union was like, hey, that would be shitty if it happened again. Here you go. Yeah. You tried to kill Fidel Castro a lot. A lot, with um, several sea insane shells. Insane amount of times, yeah. <laughs> well, like a cigar, a cigar that explodes. <laughs> like. That's right. <laughs> that's like a that's like a old tiny prank. Exactly, like, it's like a cartoon. Like, <laughs> literally, <God. laughs> some Tom and Jerry ass shit. <laughs> oh man! I mean, what is what what are JFK and Fidel Castro <laughs> if not Tom and Jerry? <laughs> <laughs> Truly, actually. So that day, Kennedy wrote a letter to Nikita Khrushchev, telling him that the United States will not tolerate the introduction of nuclear weapons into Cuba and demanded that all Soviet arms be returned back to the Soviet Union. That evening, an emergency announcement from the President of the United States was aired on national TV. Kennedy told the American people about his quarantine on Cuba and the potential nuclear threat that could initiate a World War III if any of these weapons were to be detonated. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. <laughs> that was my kind That of was accent. really good. Was it good? I, yeah, no, I liked it. Thank yeah, you. It was, it was spot on. <laughs> uh, so basically he's saying if any of these nukes are fired from Cuba at all, they the united states is going to go against the soviet union and that like if any of these weapons are launched from cuba that it's the soviet union doing it basically like it's an attack on the u.s by the soviet union so that's good 
Fun. <laughs> Fun times. So the U.S. military announces that they were at DEFCON 3 and prepared for the quarantine and military strike on Cuba. On October 24, 1962, Khrushchev responded to Kennedy's letter. Um, he was pretty pissed and said that Kennedy's naval blockade, note the use of the word blockade, of Cuba was an act of aggression and that the Soviet Union was going, was going to continue their operations in Cuba. For the next two days, Soviet ships approached the U.S. naval blockade. Some turned around and some were let through after finding that they were not carrying any nuclear weapons. But U.S. surveillance flights over Cuba reported back that the missile sites that had already been in Cuba were basically ready to go. So the military advanced to DEFCON 2. I don't really know what DEFCON means at all, but there you go. I mean, it sounds pretty uh, military <laughs> Exactly. you know. <laughs> On the afternoon of October 26th, John Scali, a ABC News correspondent, reported to the White House that he had been approached by a Soviet agent who told him that if the United States were to promise they wouldn't invade Cuba, that the Soviet Union would remove their weapons. Mm -hmm. um, the White House was skeptical of this so-called Soviet agent and had staff working overtime to authenticate this message. However, in the evening of October 26th, the U.S. received another letter from Khrushchev stating basically everything that John Scali had told them. The letter outlined that the Soviet Union would pull their weapons out of Cuba if the United States agreed not to invade. A quote from the letter says, If there is no intention to doom the world to the catastrophe of thermonuclear war, then let us not only relax the forces pulling on the ends of the rope, let us take measures to untie that knot. We are ready for this. Word. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think it was in like 2017 mm -hmm. that they're like, cause someone had requested freedom of information act shit from the government. And I think it, it, it was also like the American people at the time knew about that deal where it was like, okay, you take your nuclear weapons back and we won't invade Cuba. Mm -hmm. But I believe I'll have to make sure I fact check this, but I believe that also another stipulation that the American people didn't know about was that the U.S. had to remove their nuclear weapons from Turkey. I'm literally just about to talk uh, about that. Sorry, I, I no, hate to be okay. to the punch. You just are so informed, and I love that. <laughs> so following this beautifully worded letter, however, the next day Khrushchev sent another letter stating that this deal was only good if the U.S. also removed their missiles from Turkey, like ah. Taylor just said. Um, and then on that same day, one of the U.S. surveillance planes flying over Cuba was shot down. So Kennedy prepared for an invasion of Cuba because of the plane being shot down. Mm -hmm. um, and he sent back a letter to Khrushchev stating that if the Soviet Union were to remove the nuclear weapons from Cuba under the super supervision of the United Nations, um, that the U.S. would guarantee no military invasion of Cuba. Following this, Robert Kennedy met in secret with the Soviet ambassador to the U.S. telling him that if the U.S. had been planning... Uh, that the U.S. had been planning to remove their missiles in Turkey anyway, but that the Soviet <laughs> Union wasn't allowed to say anything publicly, and that this totally was because the U.S. wanted to do it already, and it definitely didn't have to do with anything <laughs> with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, we, we didn't, we don't even want those <laughs> missiles in Turkey, bro. Like, it was going to take them out anyway. Was, um, I'm doing it because I wanted to, not because you told me to, <laughs> honestly. And that's, again, just such fucking America shit, dude. Yeah. Like, they literally uh, send Robert Kennedy to, like, sneak and be like, yeah. we're going to do it. Just You can't say anything. We're just the fucking most prideful-ass country. Like, Oh, my God. We truly. always got to be on top. We always got to look like we're the big, big yeah. old tough guys. Like, I don't know. Yeah. We can't be like, oh, hey, um, <laughs> yeah, we are going to, like participate in agreements mm -hmm. with this country in order to not blow up the whole world <laughs> literally ruin the planet like, like that would make you seem better i think all, yeah you would think but no like yeah it's just mm, dumb it dumb baby dumb. shit it's dumb baby shit for yeah. sure so on the next day october 28th um 1962 the soviet union announced that it would dismantle and remove its missiles from cuba and then in 1963, Kennedy and Khrushchev decided to set up a hotline between the Soviet Union and the U.S. to be used in the event of another nuclear crisis. Um, because of this event, bringing both nations so close to nuclear destruction, this began the extremely, extremely slow dissolve of the Cold War, <laughs> which <laughs> continued for like 10 more years or something. Yeah. <laughs> So, as Taylor told us about last week, on November 1st, 1963, Diem, the president of South Vietnam, was assassinated. 
And not long after, on November 22nd, John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And then Lyndon B. Johnson was sworn in as the 36th president of the United States. Hey. Hey. Liddy B. Liddy B. LB, LBJ. LBJ skis. <laughs> I don't know why, but LBJ gives like big uh, LL Cool J name. Totally, vibes. Yeah. totally. I'm big fans of LL Cool J at this pod. Yeah, no, honestly, LL, ladies love. Uh, if you want to come on the pod, we're here for you. We're Please. here. We're waiting. We've got an open seat whenever you're ready. It's always open for you, LL. <laughs> <laughs> the door is always open for LL. You can talk about um, the Wu Tang Clan crazy, like, thing that happened at that one concert yeah tell us about it Ella. the wu-tang clan i mean was it the nwa nwa yeah sorry i'm that was it's okay it's sacrilege okay. <laughs> nwa so nuclear bombs <laughs> as the nuclear arms race accelerated china threw its hat into the ring by detonating their first atomic bomb on october 16th 1964 the Soviet Union and China had had a relationship around nuclear technology since about 1957. Um, they had signed an agreement to share defense technology and atomic scientists. And they were also working together to search for uranium in China to be used in atomic bombs. In June of 1959, Project 596 was developed, which was the Chinese development and testing of a nuclear bomb. Khrushchev almost immediately pulled out of the nuclear relationship with China following this, and in 1964, China detonated this bomb um, at the testing site Lopner. China had been feeling a pressure to enter the nuclear arms race due to the many clashes with America thus far during the Cold War. Yeah. Um, and Mao spoke about his decision to create and detonate nuclear bombs, saying, quote, Now we're already stronger than we were in the past, and in the future we'll be even stronger than now. Not only are we going to have more airplanes and artillery, but also the atomic bomb. In today's world, if we don't want to be bullied, we have to have this thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's unfortunate, but it's kind of how it is. Mm -hmm. Like When it's just like, okay, thanks, America and the Soviet Union, for starting off this whole like <laughs> domino effect of every fucking country being like, guess we need atomic bombs now. Yeah, I mean, again, it's. I think we've talked about it before, but it's really hard. I feel like there's kind of like a... A threshold that we we crossed where it's like mm -hmm. you can never really go back from having atomic weapons no. you know and uh that brings us to now yeah basically <laughs> everything's because terrible it's like you can say like okay yeah no we'll totally get rid of our atomic bombs i would never i wouldn't trust no that absolutely. you know what i mean so of well, course yeah. i'm gonna keep making my own atomic bombs. who wants to be the first country to get rid of their atomic bombs right yeah, like, exactly. like well you 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 do it first and they're like no you do it first right like, <laughs> it's like a western gunfight where you're exactly. like the two dudes are just standing with their guns pointed at each other like <laughs> who's it's gonna like that fucking... scene in the office where they're all like yeah, exactly. pointing the guns at each other they're like, exactly <laughs> that's basically what the cold war was <laughs> honestly that's a meme right there let's we'll uh, post it yeah we'll make that so Mao felt that China being in possession of nuclear weapons would assert their dominance over security threats and allow them to size up to the other big powers at the time. This prompted U.S. officials to speak with the Soviet Union about how to keep China's nuclear power limited, which, again, it's just one of those things of like, like the Soviet Union and the United States are like, we can have as many fucking nukes mm -hmm. as we want, but then China has one and they're like, we really should talk about this. Like, it's a huge issue. We need to figure this out, yeah. <laughs> It's so funny, and, to, and it's funny too. That's just such a funny encounter because it's like literally, um, like the United States and the Soviet Union fucking hate each hate. other, hate each <laughs> other. But then China gets one nuclear weapon, and they're like, "Uh, you want to like get lunch? Maybe we can talk about this China business." You know, like, exactly. It's fucking insane. Oh my god, nothing, nothing brings countries together like a different country also having nukes. Oh, that's uh, that's just historical fact there. <laughs> So I'm not going to go into too much detail about the Vietnam War since Taylor already did a beautiful job of covering <laughs> quite a bit of that last week. And then we are planning on doing an episode yeah. in the future. So, you know, you'll get to know the lovely details of that at some point soon. The juicy, fat, succulent <laughs> details. Slip and slide Vietnam War details. <laughs> France started to feel left out of the nuclear bomb party. And so on August 24th, <laughs> classic fucking France... August 24th, 1968, they detonated their first big-ass bomb. What really made France stand out in this nuclear pissing contest was that this was the first hydrogen bomb detonated as part of the Cold War. Oh. Yes. This 
hydrogen bomb was conveniently detonated in, I'm so sorry to butcher this, Fangatafula, Fangataufa, I'm sorry, Atoll, French Polynesia. Okay. Um, because, of course, they wouldn't be willing to sacrifice one little bit of their tiny-ass country. So <laughs> instead, outsourced the detonation of a hydrogen bomb to one of the islands they had colonized. Love it. Yeah. It's classic French shit. Super awesome. Thanks, France. They were like, I'm tired of baguettes. We want bombs. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking the French. The French. <laughs> France had announced a few years prior that they were planning to test a hydrogen bomb, and this announcement prompted China to create and detonate their own hydrogen bomb on June 17th, 1967. Okay, so are we starting to see what the Cold War was all about here? It basically, it started with a volatile relationship between the Soviet Union and the U.S., their arms race, which was then even more inflamed by the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Vietnam and Korean Wars, China's relationship with the Soviet Union, which caused Mm -hmm. China to enter the nuclear arms race, which then caused France to enter the race, which then caused China to do nuclear weapons even harder. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Nuclear weapons, too. Electric boogaloo. (laughs) Nuclear weapons, too. Nuclear weapons, harder. (laughs) Fast and nuclear. (laughs) <laughs> Nuclear weapons, Tokyo Drift. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But yeah, no, I mean, it's, yeah. It I was mean, just like domino effect of like everyone was like, mm-hmm. I guess we're doing this too now. Um, and all of this left the world in a constant state of anxiety at the prospect of a nuclear World War Three, which would basically be like two seconds long and consist of all the nuclear powers bombing each other and then subsequently destroying the rest of the world. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, super fun time to be alive. <laughs> yeah, no, and it's it's just very interesting um the whole like the whole idea cuz uh, there's been like a ton of, you know, post-apocalyptic, post-nuclear fallout like mm-hmm. media that's been made. For sure. And I think the biggest reason why something like that didn't happen was just the fact that like everybody knew that once you start bombing using nuclear weapons on each other like it's over right exactly like, so exactly it's like that idea of mutually assured destruction it's yeah like it's a it's a big thing i don't know yeah yeah which like thank god like i mean yeah <laughs> fuck nuclear bombs but like thank god that they're that destructive i guess because this that really is what saved our asses mm-hmm. during this whole thing was like everybody wanted to fucking kill each other but they were like okay but like if we do we're everyone's dead we're all dead if we do that so like can't really press that red button even though i really want to yeah yeah no it's definitely interesting and i think uh someone who's done more research on this than me (laughs) could probably write a really good essay as to like how that affected like the modern state of like warfare Mm -hmm. of what happens you know because like you don't really see excuse me oh my gosh you don't really see uh places like declaring like two countries like declaring war on each other like you used to like it's a lot of like weird faction fighting now that happens because it's like on the it's like drone strikes and like yeah you know small teams on the ground that use like all this technology and Mm -hmm. stuff because again like you couldn't just like declare war on russia because it's like you're gonna blow the fuck out of each other like (laughs) exactly exactly (laughs) and now too with like just like the different allies as well now exactly. like it's just yeah it would just we would all die we yeah would all die. but yeah it's interesting to think about how it has changed because of for all sure that. yeah for sure i mean like like you said the cold war has really affected pretty much our lives going forward mm-hmm. like since it ended it, yeah it changed everything So, of course, the other red thread running through the Cold War was the United States' profound fear and villainizing of communism. This entire thing began because the U.S. had branded communism as a huge threat to any and all American values, and the U.S. had branded the Soviet Union as the communist superpower that was trying to take over the world and was going to force everyone to be communists. And by effectively villainizing communism and naming it as the big like the big bad of the time, America was able to justify every step they took in the Cold War. Blank check. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Blank check, baby. All right. So for the next couple of years, Richard Nixon does some serious fuck shit. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Richard. Um, What's uh, the dick? 
Dick, Dick Nicks. Dick Nicks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, he does some serious fuck shit, particularly concerning the Vietnam War and also Watergate, <laughs> where he yeah. hired five men to break into the DNC headquarters and wiretap the premises. Um, and then it was also found that he had wiretapped a shit ton of American citizens and took bribes for the Republican Party and then denied any involvement in this. And then when tapes proving his involvement were found and subpoenaed by Archibald Cox, um, who was the prosecutor on the case, Nixon ordered the attor- the attorney general and deputy attorney general to fire him. Yeah. So he was uh, a great guy. <laughs> what a, what a uh, stand-up guy. Uh, yeah. It's wild that they, they're still, like, however long missing in, like, the Nixon tapes or whatever, like, mm. a certain portion of it, and everybody, like, is like, oh, that's the, the alien minutes, you know? Like, the ones <laughs> yeah, where they... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> or whatever, but... The alien minutes. It's just, I don't know, it's just funny. Like, there's still to this day, like, no one knows what the fuck was on yeah. that, like, missing 14 minutes. <laughs> Might have been seven. I don't even know, but... It's a certain gap of time that, yeah. like, that they didn't even have to have that to, like, indict Richard Nixon exactly. with. But, like, yeah. it was, like, that bad. It's like they literally only need, like, two minutes of him being, like, we should wiretap every single person in the country. <laughs> We're going to do it. <laughs> wiretap. <laughs> like, that was my Richard Nixon impression. That was good. <laughs> that was very good. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's a really bad explanation of Watergate, which, like... I'm not going to get into it, but you could also do an entire episode all about Watergate. Yeah, maybe we will. Maybe Maybe we just will. Maybe we might. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, since we're on this Cold War kick of a bunch of Cold War stuff, maybe we'll do a Watergate episode, too. Yeah. Tell us what you think about a Watergate episode, listener. Yeah. Comment down below. Weigh in. (laughs) I guess. This is a podcast. Comment on the Instagram. Comment down below our Instagram posts. Exactly. In 1972, the incredibly slow dissolve of the Cold War had a milestone towards ending. Richard Nixon and Len- Leonid Brezhnev, Brezhnev, Russian names, man, <laughs> um, met in Moscow to discuss the amount of nuclear arms within the two countries. Both Brezhnev and Nixon had their feet pretty firmly planted in the ground about winning the Cold War, but the growing tensions between the Soviet Union and China and Nixon's approval rating plummeting following the Vietnam War prompted them to try and appease their people in a different way by coming to some sort of agreement about the terribly dangerous nuclear weapons both countries had a massive amount of. Yeah, pointed at each other. Yeah, literally. Um, you know who else has massive amounts of nuclear weapons pointed at each other? Um, who? The products and services of this <laughs> very podcast. This podcast right this here? This podcast This remarks. exact one? By Taylor and Phoebe. Oh, wow. Yeah. Remarks by Taylor and Phoebe. Never heard of it. Well, <laughs> let me tell you <laughs> all about it. <laughs> nice. Let's get it on. Ooh. Uh, yeah, we're recording again. We're back. Yeah. We're hey. back. We're uh, still sexy, for sure. Sexier than ever, honestly. Actually, yeah, for sure. We only I'm... increased in our sexiness levels. It's true. It's true. Uh, everybody knows as the more you podcast, mm-hmm. like the sexier you get. Just like It's true. Yeah, like That's how I feel about every host of every podcast I listen to. Like the more episodes I listen to, I just slowly fall in love with the host like more true. and more. It's true. <laughs> yeah, it's all about them uh what do they call it? Oh, parasocial relationships, yo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like I'm listening to True and on right now and I just like I'm just in love with both both Briggs and Liz. <laughs> both of the hosts, yeah. yeah. That's the true that's the true bisexual experience though. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Aw. <clears throat> we're just really providing for the bisexuals. True. As we Look should. At us. Look at us go providing uh, your healthy dose of uh <laughs> bisexual leftism. Yeah. Yes. Bisexual <laughs> leftism. I'm changing my Twitter name to that. <laughs> <clears throat> so we're talking about um the Soviet Union and the United States trying to come to some sort of agreement about all of the fucking nuclear weapons that they have. So at the summit um, in Moscow on May 27th, 1972, both parties signed the Strategic 
Arms Limitation Talks Agreements, or SALT agreements. These agreements limited the number of anti-ballistic missile sites um, the countries could have to two each, (laughs) which I don't know why that just is funny to me. Um, This agreement also halted the production of any more intercontinental ballistic missiles or submarine-launched ballistic missiles. For all you missile heads out there. (laughs) Big missile guys. (laughs) Big missile guys. This was a huge step towards resolving conflicts between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Um, so things with the Watergate scandal, which I gave you an extremely, extremely brief summary of, were beginning to heat up. The ongoing trial had been a clear look into Nixon's corruption, um, with him bribing or trying to pull presidential strings at every turn. And in July 1974, the House Judiciary Committee had three counts against Nixon to justify an impeachment. Obstruction of justice, abuse of presidential powers, and hindrance of the impeachment process. Um, Which was for sure all true. (laughs) (laughs) All facts. All straight facts. So on August 8th, 1974, Richard Nixon addressed the American people on national television announcing his resignation from the White House. He was the first U.S. president to resign from the position. This is is a good old I'm not a crook thing. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. By taking this action, he said in a solemn address from the Oval Office. I hope that I will have hastened the start of the process. <laughs> he just reverted back to I don't JFK. Know why. By taking this action, I hope that I will have hastened the start of the process of healing, which is so desperately needed in America. <clears throat> and it's like, okay, bro. <laughs> you're the one who broke it. Like, you're exactly. the one. What do you mean healing? You're the one that did this. Like, I don't. How? Why is Nixon gaslighting the American people right now? Like, <laughs> literally though. He's like, y'all need to like heal faster. You guys are just like, you're, you're in like a really bad place. Right yeah, now. you're kind of acting crazy. Uh, <laughs> so I'm gonna get out of here, but you need to work on I yourself. Go. <laughs> <laughs> so Nixon left the White House boarding a helicopter and standing on the top step of the entrance to this helicopter, he gave us the iconic double peace sign picture. Bravo, Nixon. Bravo. You really, you really uh, took the show. Fucking class act. Immediately following Nixon's official resignation, Gerald Ford was sworn in as president. My fellow Americans, <laughs> our long national nightmare is over. I don't know why every president in my mind just has that like transatlantic yeah. accent. The Yeah, the transatlantic Nixon voice. <laughs> or I mean, JFK voice. Yeah. Um, Gerald Ford received some criticism for pardoning Nixon of all of the crimes he had committed during his administration. Um, But isn't that pretty much what all presidents will do? Excuse the last one of all the egregious crimes they committed so that they can cover their asses for all the crimes they are about to commit? (laughs) Yeah, no, I remember like there was this thing when Biden got sworn into office where people were like, are you going to try to hold Donald Trump accountable for the crimes? (laughs) Because he's like the crime guy. Yeah. And Biden was like, well, I think that we can uh, we can not do that to like restore peace and goodwill in our nation. And it's like. You just know you're going to do a bunch of crimes. And if we start making presidents have to pay for their crimes, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just going to ruin their whole thing, right? The entire (laughs) presidency. The whole job. That's what they do. Yeah. Yeah. It's a crime job. (laughs) Which that's what Ford said, too. He was like, oh, I'm just trying to stop so much division and fucking whatever. It's like, okay. Um, and there was an episode of that 70s show where Gerald Ford was coming to give a speech in the town where, like, they lived. And Eric's dad read was like chosen to ask a mm-hmm. question to the president and he gets up to the mic after Eric streaks and he's like, I have a question. How in the hell could you pardon Nixon? And I didn't understand the reference, but now I do. Now I do. Now yeah. I do. Yeah. What a good episode. I forgot about that. that but yeah. I, fucking awesome show. Oh, I loved yeah. it. I need to rewatch it, honestly. They took it off of fucking Netflix, which I'm very upset wow. about. Wow. Yeah. Fucking Netflix. Fucking Netflix. So, on October 23rd and 24th, 1974, Leonid Brezhnev and Gerald Ford met in Vladivostok to have a meeting to discuss the furthering of arms control between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. This had already been started with the SALT agreements, and this meeting was another indication of a step in the right direction concerning the arms race. During this summit, the two nations agreed to limit limit themselves to an equal number of weapons each. So, in January of 1980, Jimmy Carter um, was president, and, or no, yes, in January of 1980, Jimmy Jimmy Carter Carter had been president, and he had imposed an embargo on grain to the Soviet Union. 
This was his way of lashing back at the Soviet Union for invading Afghanistan in 1979. This embargo was a poor decision on Carter's part because all this really accomplished was the Soviet Union realizing that they did not need to rely on grain from the U.S. And (laughs) in fact, they were able to find cheaper grain trade through Argentina. Classic. (laughs) Yeah. But however, in the United States, this embargo had a big effect on American politics and was the focus of the farm strike movement in 1980 where farmers surrounded the USDA offices to protest the embargo. They literally came in on tractors and (laughs) surrounded the offices. That's insane. (laughs) Insane. Yeah. I'd feel like the more you learn about, like, the Cold War, especially with just how, like, big of a power the Soviet Union was at Mm -hmm. the time, the more you kind of realize that, like, the only reason why the U.S. is, like, considered the world superpower or whatever is just, like, pure luck. Like, we just got lucky because we made so many dumbass fucking decisions the entire way like (laughs) there was no competency on our part (laughs) like it was all just like dumb fucking luck that we like came out on top of that literally like (laughs) literally yeah it's just like thank god that the people in the soviet union didn't like um fucking gorbachev exactly yeah that's the only reason why this ended up with us winning if you will but even then it's like okay now i'm um, like thank thank goodness but also now we're stuck with america being the world exactly. superpower i mean yeah thank god yeah. for the people that are leading america i suppose <laughs> yeah yeah so during ronald reagan's campaign for president in 1980 he promised an end to this grain embargo if elected which he promptly did in 1981 partnering with the farm bureau to end the grain embargo however while the soviet union did pick up um the grain trade with us again They had already found a better grain importer, and the trade with America ended up being very minimal following this whole fucking thing. So, good job, America. You Nice. Really done it again. (laughs) Really did it again, yeah. (laughs) I think it's funny that Jimmy Carter has, like, he, like, builds houses in, like, developing countries now. Like, he's still alive, and he, yeah, he's, like, very, like, humanitarian, because he's, like, a devout Christian and whatnot. Mm, mm. Uh but yeah, he That'll like feels like he has to like build houses to pay for like the war crimes he committed as president. Like it's like yeah, Jimmy. like yeah. <laughs> maybe you should do some other things maybe, as well. Maybe uh, just being president isn't. Uh, well, first off, maybe it's just a bad job, and maybe yeah. it shouldn't exist. Maybe but presidents are a bad idea. Maybe leaders are a bad idea. <laughs> So, um, despite this agreement with the Soviet Union to end the embargo on grains, Reagan still very much perceived the Soviet Union as a threat. And he announced in October 1981 that he planned to ramp up military defense and spending by $180 billion over the next six years. Some of this $180 billion would go to the Star Wars Defensive Missile Program. Yeah. Which is a stupid fucking name. <laughs> <laughs> like the show? Like the lightsaber show? Yeah, like, <laughs> like come on. That's so dorky. Yeah. Um, Reagan also wanted to develop a system that would be capable of defending the U.S. from a nuclear attack. Reagan continued to sour the relationship between Cuba and the U.S., and in 1982, he banned travel to Cuba for all U.S. citizens. The reasoning was to keep American citizens from spending American money on the communist Cuban economy. Um, But then this travel ban ended up including prohibiting any Cuban government officials from visiting the United States, which is... Yeah. Okay. Um, This travel ban still stands to in some way to this day um in our lifetime we saw a softening during the well in, in our lifetime yeah. you and my um during the obama administration but the following trump administration tightened back up travel restrictions um which as i was saying earlier u.s citizens can visit cuba now but you have to receive special approval <laughs> thank god it wasn't in reagan's lifetime thank god he didn't <laughs> live long enough to see that <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. oh the man would, is rolling in his grave Good. Let him. <laughs> let him. Let, let him, him roll. fucking quadruple zillion kickflip his, <laughs> in his grave. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> On September 1st, 1983, the Soviet-American relationship took another hit that heated the Cold War back up. The Korean Airlines flight 007, which I kind of just think Ooh. it's funny that it's called that. <laughs> um, I don't think they actually called it 007, but it is 007. 007 yeah. 
Um, anyway, this flight was headed from New York to Seoul in what should have been a regular um, layover to Alaska. The plane inexplicably started heading towards Russia. The plane flew over the Kamchatka Peninsula, where the Soviet Union was conducting top-secret military practices. The Soviets sent two fighter planes to stop the Korean Airlines plane. The Soviet ground control was attempting to make contact with the pilot, but was unsuccessful. So responding to what one of the Soviet fighter pilots had interpreted as a refusal to communicate, he fired a heat-seeking missile at the Korean plane, shooting it down. The plane crashed into the Sea of Japan, and all 269 passengers were killed. The Soviet Union believed that this plane had been a U.S. associate attempting to spy on the top-secret operations of the Soviet military. Ronald Reagan described this event as a massacre and said that the Soviets had turned against the world and the moral precepts which guide human relations among people everywhere. Woof. Woof, yeah. I I mean, yeah. I mean, it's not it's not tight to shoot planes down, for sure. <laughs> but, like, why, why the fuck was it flying over the Soviet Union, first off? Mm-hmm. And why didn't they respond when they were trying to get in touch with them? Like, yeah, yeah. I don't know, like... I mean, it's it just seems like a dumb misunderstanding. It but was just it was all just a huge misunderstanding. Is yeah. what they get the conclusion. That but I'm sure Reagan was just like jonesing to have something to jump down. Fucking no, that's exactly the Soviet Union's throat like, about. Yeah, which so of course <clears throat> the CIA was like, no, this was not a spy plane. Which like yeah. it actually wasn't. There was spy planes for sure, yeah. but this wasn't one of them. <laughs> um, yeah, and so then Ronald Reagan used this to be like, see, they're ho- they're so evil. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, I mean, again, yeah, it's fucked up to shoot down a plane, but you know America would do the same shit, no, the 100%, same exact shit. 100%. Yeah. yeah. The, so following this, Reagan oh, <clears throat> got a little sexy there. <laughs> Ronald Reagan. Following this, Reagan <laughs> suspended any flights from the Soviet Union to the United States and ended negotiation of several agreements between the two nations. So, like, things were kind of going good for a minute. Like, we were really starting Mm -hmm. to get to some sort of, like, figuring something out about the so many nuclear weapons that we had aimed right at each other. And then it just, like, Reagan fucking was like, you know what, actually, no. Let's (laughs) Cold War some more and drag (laughs) this fucking thing out. Again, Cold War... Uh, Tokyo Drift. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Colder warrior. <laughs> <laughs> too cold, too war. <laughs> <laughs> too cold, too war. <laughs> um, on March 10th, 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev was appointed Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Gorbachev's leadership style was much different than the leaders before him, and his ideologies and policies leaned more democratic socialist and even somewhat capitalist. He felt that the Soviet Union was behind the U.S. in production and proposed plans to accelerate to accelerate production and productivity. He even started the inklings of corporate conglomerates when he merged several committees for industries together. His ideas and new policies were not very popular amongst the Soviet citizens, especially his policies towards alcohol. <laughs> oh, no. And this is just a hilarious little tidbit. So in the 1980s, drunkenness was considered a major social problem in the Soviet Union, (laughs) and Gorbachev was hell-bent on solving it. He reduced alcohol production by 40%, which is a fucking lot. Oh, yeah. And then (laughs) in Russia? Yeah, (laughs) no, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Um, He raised the legal drinking age from 18 to 21. Again, just uh, not, not your best moment, Gorb. Oof. He increased alcohol prices, and stores were not allowed to sell alcohol before 2 p.m. Um, he strengthened laws around public intoxication as well. Um, and while there were some positives from these policies, crime rates falling and life expectancy increasing, sure, <laughs> the outcry from the public far outweighed them. The Soviets began making their own moonshine at home. <laughs> I mean... Come on, I like, come on, like you, we did that shit. Exactly. And like, I don't know, what fucking. Like we've already been down this exactly. road, Gorby. And, and it didn't go well for us yeah. either. Like, and like, and like America loves their alcohol, but Russia loves I, their alcohol. It's too cold to not no, exactly. get drunk in Russia all yeah. the time. Like, I would be drunk always. Uh, always, absolutely, yeah. Like, I, I mean. I already want to be drunk most of the time <laughs> in here in Utah. So. <laughs> yeah, it's too cold for me here. I'm not trying to fucking go to Russia. Yeah. 
or not be drunk in Russia, I guess. <laughs> I am trying to go to Russia. I'd yeah, really no, like I'd like, to. it'd be cool to see. It would be very cool. Um, so Soviets were making their own fucking experimenting, making goddamn <laughs> toilet wine at home. <laughs> <laughs> and the Soviet economy took a serious hit. Um, of course, the Soviet public was also very upset with these policies, which made Gorbachev even more unpopular. Mm-hmm. So Gorbachev was seeking to improve Soviet relations with the U.S., and he was horrified at the possibility of nuclear war between the two nations. He literally was like, could not fucking believe what had been happening all throughout the Cold mm-hmm. War. It was like, how have we let it get to this? <laughs> fair, fair question, I yeah. suppose, yeah. Um, Gorbachev met with Reagan several times over the next few years with a dream to abolish all nuclear weapons, which that's a beautiful dream, Gorbachev, but uh, you have bad news for you. I admire <laughs> your uh, I- idealism. <laughs> for sure. Ronald Reagan went into these meetings with a much more conservative stance. Still feeling slighted by the previous leaders of the Soviet Union, he had nicknamed the country the Evil Empire, which look in a mirror. Yeah, it's like, uh, (laughs) yeah. In November of 1985, they met in Geneva to discuss arms reductions and try to come up with a solution to the Cold War. These meetings at Geneva were tense. Reagan did not agree with Gorbachev's policies and wanted to continue the U.S. defense program. Um, He just fucking really wanted to keep making nukes. Gorby was frustrated with Reagan's refusal to cut down on weapons and found him to be an idiot. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After another meeting in January of 1986, Gorbachev described Reagan as extraordinarily primitive, troglodyte, and intellectually feeble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and that's just like because it's funny because I feel like since since uh, Reagan, there's been like this weird like you know uh, toxic masculine mm. uh, strong man type thing that like all the Republican right. senators and presidents have all kind of go for like oh we we got to be the the big strong ones we got to show how strong we right. are and it's like Gorbachev Gorbachev is that how you say that mm-hmm. was just like hey man like we're gonna destroy the entire world <laughs> yeah. if we don't figure this out. He was like, Reagan's like, oh, well, we're we're tough. We're big tough guys. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Gorbachev like looked at what was happening. He was like, holy fuck. Yeah, he's like, this is bad. <laughs> yeah. And Reagan's like, okay, but I'm gonna look dumb if I get rid of my nukes. Yeah, he's so. like, I my nukes uh, make me look like a big strong, mm-hmm. big strong, uh, big strong boy. <laughs> And I t- can't not look like a big strong boy. You compensating for something, hmm. Reagan? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> do we want to? Uh, do we want to riff on the size of Reagan's penis? Is I that, mean, like, are we gonna? Probably not. Do we want to go down this road? No, <laughs> is, is the, is the answer. question. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I don't want to know the size of anyone's penis. Well, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't. What is happening in this episode? Get, oh, I like it, but I can't. We just got to continue. <laughs> anyway, the Geneva summit ended with both parties agreeing to work together to avoid nuclear war and to meet for two more summits. At a summit in October 1986, both Reagan and Gorby expressed a desire to abolish nuclear weapons. <laughs> Reagan received a lot of criticism for agreeing to nuclear abolition, which is great. Again, it's the yeah. big strong boy. Mm hmm. It's like, how could you be mad about that? Anyway. On October 9th, 1989, one of the biggest pieces of the ending of the Cold War occurred, the opening of the Berlin Wall. The wall had been erected by the Soviet Union in order to keep U.S. influence out of East Berlin. After World War II, when Germany's territories were split up, Berlin was split in half, the eastern half going to the Soviet Union and the western half to the United States, England, and France. The Soviet Union became increasingly frustrated with capitalist West Berlin migrants entering East Berlin, and so in August of 1961, Khrushchev ordered a wall to be elected between the two halves of the city. On June 12, 1987, Ronald Reagan arrived in West Berlin to give a speech addressing Gorbachev, asking him to remove the wall. Um, and that's like the f- extremely fucking brief explanation of the Berlin Wall. Yeah, there's so much more to there's it. There's a lot to it. But, but that's basically what you need to know. Um, Reagan had to give the speech behind two layers of bulletproof glass because the tensions in Berlin were so high and Reagan was not popular amongst the Berliners. Oh, yeah. I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah. Um, And this is where we get the famous tear down that wall line. Mm -hmm. Reagan said in his speech, 
Reagan. Yeah. <laughs> For a second, I thought I said the wrong president. It's been a lot of presidents during this. Yeah. Reagan said in his speech, Quote, we welcome change and openness, for we believe that freedom and security go together, that the advance of human liberty can only strengthen the cause of world peace. There is one sign the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable, that would advance, advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberation, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Woo. Yeah. Yeah. On November 9th, 1989, it was announced to East and West Berliners that they were allowed to travel freely between the two halves of the city. East and Westerners clinked beers and glasses of champagne, and several citizens took hammers and pickaxes to the wall and began tearing the wall down themselves. Not long after this monumental event came the announcement of the end of the Cold War. Mm Mm-hmm. On December 2nd, 1989, Mikhail Gorbachev and President Bush Sr. met to discuss how the nations would move forward. They announced that they would work together to reunify Germany and begin the New World Order, which was a movement towards democracy and peace. The Soviet Union fell fairly quickly following the end of the Cold War, and on December 26, 1991, the Supreme Soviet officially dissolved the Soviet Union. So... Um, that is your most succinct, succinct as possible story of the Cold War. Of course, so many details and events had to be left out because otherwise this podcast would just have to become strictly a Cold War podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wanted to do this so that when you hear the term Cold War or hear references to it, you can have a little bit more of an understanding of what the Cold War actually was. Um, we didn't even talk about the space race. I barely covered the Berlin Wall, which could be an episode on its own. Mm-hmm. We hardly got to how the Cold War affected wars in other countries like Vietnam, Korea, Afghanistan, Iraq etc um we didn't even touch on the dulles brothers yeah Yeah, and iran as well um we didn't even touch on the dulles brothers monumental influence yes oh my god oh those fucking guys those fucking dudes (laughs) yeah and how they (laughs) shaped like anti-communist propaganda in the u.s the watergate scandal could be its own Mm -hmm. episode you know but it's important to know what this war was about and why it persisted the way it did so that you can understand how it continues to influence our politics to this very day Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's insanely important because the majority of, like, the anti-communist propaganda that we've all been fed comes directly from the Cold War. Exactly. And, you know, again, and I think we've been pretty clear that we aren't, you know, like, the biggest, uh, you know, we're not, like, tankies. We don't, like, follow the Soviet line, like, 100%. (laughs) Like, Soviet Union did some fucked up things, but America did just as many fucked up things. Right, exactly, exactly. So I think that that's, you know, the, what do they say? Like the victors write history or whatever. So it's Mm. like, you know, the Soviet Union's not around anymore, but so you've kind of just been told what you've been told about it. Exactly. Yeah. And the Soviet Union like didn't do shitty things because they were communist. It's just because like they had bad leaders. They had bad leaders and they were a giant world superpower exactly like, i don't know yeah but yeah good stuff So there we go that's that's all that's all she wrote <laughs> and she being you <laughs> <laughs> she being phoebe yeah i think it'd be cool to have a piece of the berlin wall i know some people oh, do yes i agree yeah i don't know anybody who does but i've heard that's a thing some people have <laughs> yeah same i was thinking that while i was writing it because there's like all that like cool graffiti on it and everything mm-hmm. And there's, like, still bits of it just, like, up <coughs> as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Crazy stuff. Wild. Um, Wild. Let's, uh, let's plug some things, let's plug I guess. Let's plug some things. Oh, I guess we will start by doing a little shout out. Yeah. Um, so our question, which I had uh, proposed, pre- pre- prepositioned <laughs> on... Uh, on uh, Spotify was, what color is Phoebe's hair? <gasps> And mega fan Emily, <laughs> our fucking girl, our fucking said bestie. our fucking bestie said emerald green, which, which it is is true. It's that very is true. absolutely Phoebe's hair color. So thanks, Emily. We love you literally so much. <laughs> so 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 much. So 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 much. Um, and yeah, where yeah. Uh, where can I listen to Remarks, Phoebe? Well, you can listen to Remarks on uh, Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, where you should leave a review, um, rate and review, and also subscribe on both of those listening platforms. Um, <laughs> I know it's on other ones as well that aren't like as cool or whatever. <laughs> um, Not quite as popular as yeah. those, but... yeah. Um, 
Taylor, if I were to go on Twitter.com and I wanted to interact with Remark's podcast, how would I find them? Um, so you have uh, you have a few options. Uh, right. You could try looking up Remarks, first of all. True. Or the actual at is at Remarks Pod. Love, love to see it. I don't think that there would be too much to pop up under Remarks other than us. Probably but not. I think maybe. we are like one of very few are, that have that name the which, remarks yeah. we are the one the. and only <laughs> um communist podcast that exists at all yeah uh, <laughs> pretty sure there's no other like leftist podcast no out there yeah no so this is the only one you get to listen to exactly. sorry exactly like what are you gonna do listen to a different one no no absolutely not <laughs> um you can also look at things on our instagram on at remarks podcast on instagram mm-hmm. and tiktok at remarks podcast which we finally Taylor made another TikTok that's amazing, and I'm going to post it on the TikTok, and I posted it on our Reels on Instagram, our first yeah. Reel. First so, Reel, go give it a like. Yeah, go give it a like, go give it a little commie comment. <laughs> commie comment, <laughs> yeah. Taylor, um, if I wanted to have video format with <laughs> just my boy Taylor talking about things that he desires to talk about, where would I go? Uh, you could go to um, the website youtube.com okay. and uh, you could search up the lefty agenda and you could find some videos that I've made. Amazing. I will be sure to do that. HTTP colon backslash backslash youtube.com. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's forward slash the lefty agenda. <laughs> mm-hmm. Perfect. Um, and yeah, I think that's, uh, that's it. That's it. That's all. So thanks for listening and K love, love you. you. Bye. Bye.